Uh, this gentleman, folks, speaks to Fortune 500 companies like it's, it is his job. I mean, he's taken this and made it his passion. It's what he loves to do, talk leadership. I'm not going to tell too much of his story because he's going to tell it to you all as he goes along today. So without any further ado, the world-renowned, the world-traveled Justin Patton. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I just want to say it's been an amazing two days, and I'm really honored to be here with you. So thank you for the last two days just sharing your stories with me. I'm going to be talking about some of you in here and talking about the way that you lead. But listen, I'm all about having fun and the way we learn. So you're not going to sit here and just listen to me talk for an hour. We're going to get up, we're going to get moving, you're going to learn a little bit about yourself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a few questions. And if you agree with this question, I want you to yell yes. But you've got to yell yes so loud that everyone outside of here is like, what is going on there? Squad guy, you should have no problems with this. Where are you, okay? All right, you ready? So I want you to say yes if you agree. Would you say that sometimes as athletes you just get so busy being busy that you lose yourself in the process? Yes? yes. And I want you to say yes if you say that, you know, yesterday you learned about transformational leadership. Would you believe that, or would you agree that transformation really starts with transforming yourself? Yes? Yes. And the final one, would you also say that transformational leadership is really about being a champion for other people and lifting other people up? Yes? So as I've gotten ready to come here, I've been doing a lot of thinking. What does it even mean to really be a champion? Because a lot of you are champions on the court, on the competitive field. And so when I think about, you know, people that are champions in life, I think about people like um, Michael Phelps or Muhammad Ali, Malalia. I think about Oprah. I think about, um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa. And I'm like, what do they do differently than other people? So before we get started, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person beside you, and I want you to tell them, when you think about someone that's actually a champion, who comes to mind for you? And tell that person, the person beside you. What does it actually mean to even be a champion? And here's the actual definition. So it's someone who fights or speaks publicly in support of a person, belief, or cause. And then I ask myself this question. How would your life change right here in this room? How would the way that you lead actually change if you could be a champion in your own life? Would you agree that sometimes you become a champion for everyone else but yourself? Yes? Yeah, a lot of people. You know, as an executive leadership coach, I get to travel the country and I get to work with people just like you, whether it's college athletes or whether it's executives in Fortune 500 companies. And I'll tell you, everything that you all just said yes to, everyone faces it. People get busy being busy. And sometimes they're so busy that the last person they take care of is themselves. Every one of you in this room, every one of you lead, communicate, and love based on everything that you've been through in your life. Would you agree with that? Yes? What you've learned and what you've been through, that is the reason you show up and lead the way that you do. And the person sitting beside you, they have untold stories that they've never told you that is shaping the way that they actually lead people. And so for the young lady that shared her story, I honor you for that story. And so I want to just share really quickly about my untold story that you probably don't know about me and the reason why, how it affected my leadership and, and kind of some dangerous stuff that had happened in my life. So in 1998, I started college. Thought I was going into law enforcement, possibly the FBI. Started in 1998. On the weekend of September 19th, I decided to come home. And my dad had actually had surgery and was recovering from surgery. He was that champ in my life. My dad had been in the Air Force. He fought in Vietnam. We grew up on a farm in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And he could, he could fix everything. So he was a, really a champion. Never saw my dad really get emotional or anything. And I remember that day, he was, he was going through a lot of pain through this month of recovery since I'd been gone to college. And... During that time, he wasn't able to help me move into my college dorm room or anything So he was, you know, as he was recovering. So I came home that weekend, and my dad took me to go get, college, get, get groceries for my dorm room, took me to get my hair cut. And when I came home, my mom had made lunch, and we all sat down at the kitchen table. My mom is actually in front of me. My dad is to the side of me, and I'm actually sit, I'm sitting right here at the table. And I knew that something was wrong because right in the middle of um, when we were having lunch, my dad put his fork down, he tilted his head down, and he started crying. And it was the first time in 18 years I had ever seen my dad cry. So I didn't really understand what was happening. We just thought it was someone recovering from surgery because we never had anyone in our family have surgery. Didn't know what that process was like. So I remember finishing my lunch, and I walk over to the other side of the, in the living room, and I was kind of eavesdropping on my parents. And they were on the phone with the doctor. And the doctor said, bring him in tomorrow. We're going to check him out, make sure he's okay, and we'll go from there. So I was actually teaching band programs in Kentucky at that time. So I went off. I said goodbye, and I love you to my dad, and I left. And when I came home, I found out my dad had actually died. He died in my mom's arms. My mom was actually rubbing his chest because his chest was hurting really bad. And I don't know if any of you in this room have ever had that moment where your heart kind of does something weird or kind of flutters really quickly. It did that to my dad. My mom goes, Bruce, are you okay? 
And he was like, yeah, but if it happens again, we should probably go to the doctor. And then it happened again, and it killed him instantly. All his organs shut down at one time. And what we have found is in the month after my dad's surgery, he had actually developed a bacteria infection. So for the entire month that he was in so much pain and we just thought he was recovering, it was bacteria growing in his body and eventually just shut all of his organs down. So let me tell you what it did to this, this guy that was 18 years old. The, the, the positive thing that it did, I became super passionate. I was like, listen, my dad was 46 years old when he died. I was only 18. And I go, I don't know how long I have here, but I'll make a mark and I'll make a difference. So I went into education. Here's the really destructive thing that it did. So as an 18-year-old guy who didn't know how to handle loss that deeply or that big, the only thing I knew was, how to, was to shut off emotionally. So I completely disconnected emotionally. Um, how many of you ever heard of a woman named Ilana Van Zandt? Anyone know her? She has a show. Oh, <laughs> whoop, whoop. All right, so she has a show on Oprah called Fix My Life. She's probably the world's most renowned life coach. And she said, there's a lot of people, even people in this room today, you are dead from your neck down. And that's what happened. For the next 10 years, all I did was live from my head. I led from my head. I communicated. I loved that way. And I was emotionally disconnected. And it all worked until I got into leadership. And as a leader, how could I connect with people? I couldn't even connect with myself. How was I going to have empathy for people when I couldn't even have empathy for myself? So I had to stop, and I actually had to go back, and I had to do my work. And so here's the reason I'm going to tell you. Every one of you, just like me, have a story based on what you've been through, based on what you've experienced, that has shaped the reason you lead the way that you lead. It was interesting. I was going to a lot of your colored, the colored rooms yesterday, and I heard a woman in there say, listen, I, I, I lead a lot from my head, and sometimes I'm kind of aggressive. It is because of what she has been through in her life, and she's had to fight her way through. That is why she leads the way that she does. But I realized maybe there was a different way. But I could not lead differently until I was willing to change my story. And so everything that I do now as a coach is to help people change their story, to say maybe there's a different way to lead that's even better. And I'm going to tell you a great example about changing your story, and then we're going to get going on this stuff. How many of you ever, raise your hand if you ever watched The Biggest Loser. Anyone ever watched it? A lot of you. So in The Biggest Loser, right, weight loss competition at the end of the week, they weigh people in. Whoever's lost the, the, the lowest weight, they end up going home. Season 14, they changed all the rules. And at season 14, they decided at the end of the week, when they, after everyone had worked out, they were going to draw, they were going to roll a dice, and whoever's name ended up on that die, that, that was the person whose weight was going to have to weigh in. And if their weight was the lowest, they were gonna, someone was going to go home. So all the pressure was on one person on the entire team. And this woman named Gina on that season was freaking out. And, she was, and so Bob Harper took her aside, and he was like, he, he actually said this line that has stuck with me the rest of my life. He says, why does everyone in life have to be successful? Why does everyone have to, you know, lead their life out of love and out of, out of success? And why do you constantly lead your life out of fear? At what point will you just stop and say, let it be me? Let it be me. Because, you know, I think about, I was talking to some of you right before we get started. And, you know, Pat Summit, I really admire Pat Summit a lot. And she said this to all her team members. She says, life is competitive and people keep score. But sometimes as adults, we say, do your thing, don't compete. Life is, com you are competing right now in this room. You're competing for the same scholarships, the same jobs. But we can teach people how to be competitive and how to do it with integrity and self-worth. But the thing about what I love about what she said, right, is you can, at some point, you just got to stop saying, why does it have to be everyone else in this room? At what point do you just stop and say, let it be me? And so what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about what does it actually take for you to actually let it be you? And that's what we're going to do. I'm going to talk about three things that I believe if you want to be a champion in your life today, that you got to be willing to do these three things. So are you all in? Yes? yes. Are you willing to do the work? Yes? yes. All right. So let's get started.